Hello, Islam Likum, and good morning to everyone. Uh, before starting the session, we just want to know and confirm am I audible to you all people? Is it loud and clear to everyone there? Okay, G, uh, let me open the question box and I can read your questions. Right. So here we are at day three of the webinar. I'm Farooq and today we're going to explore some new chapters, new topics, inshallah. Right. And today we're going to explore our chapter 7 in our sequence and that chapter name is diversity and equal opportunity right okay first of all we need to know what the chapter is all about the chapter is all about two core areas one is diversity and one is equal opportunity right We'll start with equal opportunity and then we'll move to diversity. Okay, first topic we're going to explore is equal opportunities. As we discussed earlier, even in this webinar also, that uh, organization has to have equal opportunity, right? And what is equal opportunity? It's a process of giving equal, fair, value, treatment to all people that what is equal opportunity it's the process of providing equal fair value treatment like when there are many people in front of you you need to handle them equally in terms of uh, uh, what you can say at the time of hiring we can say or at the time of promotion we can say or providing any training and development opportunities and redundancy decisions, right? Because what happens when you don't offer equal opportunity people, actually what you are doing, you are doing discrimination, right? So equal opportunity means giving equal fair value treatment. For example, there are four candidates, there are four candidates for a cashier job. We need to judge them on the basis of merit only. If we are doing this and we are selecting people on the basis of merit then this is equal opportunity and if we are not doing so but other than merit then it is discrimination and it should not be happening right discrimination usually conducts on the basis of we can say gender discrimination where people favors one particular gender over other if this is the case this is what we call gender-based discrimination and other could be uh, language for example someone is preferring someone over other languages if i belong to language a and i speak language a so and if i am doing this that i am favoring someone with language a so this is some kind of a language-based discrimination it could be ethnic based ethnic in the sense that uh, you can say it ethnicity defines what from where area you belong right which city or province or state or area that's called ethnic discrimination so ethnic based it's pretty much familiar with language it could be a religion based right if someone belongs to religion a and he is preferring people of religion a only right so obviously this is a religious based discrimination and it should not happen actually we are not you're not supposed to hire people on the basis of religion next area is could be discrimination what you can say marital status right if you are hiring someone because he or she is married or unmarried you cannot hire anyone on the basis of being married or not married or single or <coughs> in relationship because when you hire people 
you it's the very it's their personal matter usually what happens if i give you a practical example some of the organization what they do they hire male uh, uh, members with marital status uh, married they prefer married male members over unmarried because they think that married male, male members are more responsible as compared to unmarried male members right number one point number two point what happens what they believe that a married it, it is very difficult for a married male member because having so much responsibilities he will not be able to switch easily from one organization to the second organization but if someone is unmarried with lesser responsibilities it is more likelihood there's a more chance that he or she might leave the organization so this is what marital status is all about did you get my point if you're doing so this is marital status based discrimination another discrimination reason could be physical disability people discriminate with other people on the basis of their physical looks right that's that's also what we call body shaming you cannot actually do it it's it's a crime right if someone is having some problem in their in his or her leg you cannot judge him for the post of accountancy or accountant or cashier just because he or she is having some problem in his leg but one thing there should be noted here if this physical disability can create hindrance in the job can affect the job then the case is different for example if you're looking for an accountant right and there is a candidate who has some problem in leg foot then it should not be uh, focused right we should not focus his physical disability but if someone is having a problem in his or her leg and that candidate is applying for a post of a driver so being a driver you need to have more fitness requirement as compared to an accountant the fitness requirement of accountant are different and the fitness requirement of driver are different so if that physical disability is creating some trouble in the job then it could be uh, assessed did you get my point Hello everyone, can you listen me? Okay. Did you get the difference between that physical disability matter? If that physical disability issue is creating problem for the job directly, then it could be considered. But if it is not having any issue with the job then it should not be considered okay G, next we have there could be uh, a discrimination on the basis of and other thing for example people can be discriminated on the basis of other things right for example i just as i discussed you earlier it could be on the basis of physical disability and marital status gender language ethnic religion and other stuff i hope this serves the purpose moving forward next we have types of discrimination right there are different types of discrimination which people which people do with others one is direct discrimination in which you openly discriminate with someone 
like you gave an ad in the advertisement you gave an advertisement in the uh, newspaper and that advertisement is written a male accountant is required you know it's you are openly having a discrimination and if i say male accountant is required what kind of discrimination it is answer now quick 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 if someone says a male accountant is required what kind of discrimination it is it is what kind of discrimination means is it gender based language based is the gender based discrimination and it is direct discrimination because you are openly discriminating with someone but if you what about indirect indirect discrimination means when you make such a policy if you make such a policy which apparently is okay but when you apply that policy when you make a policy which apparently looks okay but when you actually apply that policy most of candidates don't fall under it right like for example for example there is a male university right and in that male university there is a notice board and on that notice board you write an advertisement which says accountant required right so if that if it is a male university obviously the students will be male over there and they are reading at the notice board and that notice board says accountants required now there is no word male accountants required but we all know that this university belongs to male only obviously only male members of the society will read the notice board and only male members will need the not read the notice board and only male members will apply for it and it's very much chance that only male members will be appointed for that job so this is some kind of an indirect discrimination where you make a normal appearance but when you actually look down that look deep down that policy there is a problem in it apparently it look if you read that advertisement apparently it's okay right there's no problem accountant is required it's a very simple word but when you actually apply it you find it that particular kind of gender cannot actually fall into it cannot actually fulfill that criteria because they're not actually there to read it did you get my point over there you get this okay next we have what are the particular areas where discrimination actually occurs what are the what are those situations what are those places what are those occasions which where discrimination occurs this is very important discrimination occurs most of the times at the time of hiring because at the time of hiring if you are hiring particular kind of gender eventually they will be get promotion they eventually they will get training and development opportunity eventually they will have readiness so what happens that any organization usually have discrimination at four points one hiring two at the time of promotion people promotes people uh, usually bosses give promotions to those who are an apple of their eye right those who are in their good books that is promotion and the third area which where we usually have this uh, what we can say discrimination that is called training and development opportunities like if i am a manager if someone is a manager and he has some training and development opportunities to give to the people he only gives those training opportunities to those to which 
to them he is more favorable you should not decide whom should be going for training just because of your favoritism your personal liking and disliking but actually it should be based on organization needs and individual needs we need to keep things number one important point organization needs number two individual needs not personal opinion not personal opinion not personal opinion this student he is asking that uh, where we can get this working you get this working in that whatsapp group i uh, yesterday i sent the pdfs of uh, day 1 and day 2 noted pdf didn't you get it tnd means training and development marisa asked the question that is training and development training and tnd means training and development what i am focusing here is training and development opportunities for example there are two training and development opportunities one is very good and one is okay so what i did with i am more comfortable there is an employee of my uh, in my favorite list what i did i send him or her on that particular very good training and development opportunity and this is something which should not be happening over there an organization should conduct training and development session on the basis of right so those people who want notes without noting they can go to the handout section of this webinar and if they are looking for some notes of noted notes those noted notes are available in my whatsapp group right you can join it the third area is very the fourth area is very important that is redundancy Okay, Mariam and Marisa, is it clear to you? Then we can move to point number four. okay the fourth point is redundancy as i told you in class 1 day 1 what is the meaning of redundancy can anyone tell me quick 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 can anyone tell me the the meaning of redundancy because if you remember we clearly discussed the meaning and difference of termination and redundancy exactly what magna has just responded that is removing the post same reply from mohammed zishan removing the post yes termination is when you remove people and redundancy is when you remove post for example you have got four cashiers right cashier 1 cashier 2 cashier 3 cashier 4 for for example you have got four cashiers in your bank but now you only need three cashiers now what do you need to do you need to choose one cashier being redundant so if i ask you what should be the proper procedure how should i choose one of the cashiers whom should be removed any suggestions what should be the method or what do you say your opinion in this regard saif uh, replied with the word experience okay any other thing any other response how we should choose person one among these four 
Arisha responded with performance. Yes, the correct answer is performance. When we took the performance, the level of performance, the level this was one, two, three, and four. So we ranked according to ranking. So what we did, we have ranking performances one, two, three, four. So what we need to do here is we need to remove this fourth person, right? Because he's the one who is least performer. So according to performance, overall performance, ideally we should remove number four. But this number four is my friend. Oh, oh, oh. If number is four is my friend, I will remove number three because he is not good with me. Few days back, he didn't responded me well. I had some personal issue with him. So I removed cashier number one. And this redundancy decision is a discriminative one because I didn't choose people on the basis of performance, but on the basis of my personal preferences. Did you get this? Okay, there's a student, Marisa, she said, can, can we remove the last person? No, we cannot remove on the basis of first or last or sequence. We can only judge people on the basis of performance. Performance, the merit is the only criteria. Is this clear to everyone? I hope so. Okay, moving forward. This was equal opportunity. Any question regarding equal opportunity you people have? So we can move to the next topic that is diversity. Warren says no. Okay, Warren, thank you for responding. Okay, G, moving on. Next we have topic is diversity. You know what is diversity? In simple words, we can say it is mixed workforce, right? It is a mixed workforce. If I ask you a simple example, if I ask you a very, very, very simple example, Apparently, it looks as if it is not related to a topic, but it is very effective. Have you ever eaten the mixed fruit bowl? You must have tried it, huh? Mixed fruit bowl. Can anyone give me a good reason of eating a mixed fruit bowl? Anyone, a good reason. Any logical reason, if you can say, why we need to have a mixed fruit bowl? uh okay Zishan says we can get protein proteins from fruit i don't think so that fruits contain much proteins okay maybe i'm not a nutritionist in this idea Saf says it could create a nice taste Meghna says to get more nutrition someone said more flavors someone says you can get iron from apple some it's okay right so every uh you eat more fruits at once. Uh, this is, this could be, you can have a chance to eat more fruits at a time. Mixed taste. Someone is not happy with it. They are saying, <laughs> pure form of sugar consumption. <laughs> okay. Uh, he says, can I, we should not do, uh, eat this, right? One of the reasons is, every, like, you see, Allah created different kinds of foods, right? And when Allah created different kinds of food, Allah gave every food a different nutrition, right? When every food has different nutrition, so if we keep consuming the, the same kind of a food, we will be missing, we would be missing other nutrition with other food. So it's advisable to have a mixed fruit chart because mixed fruit bowl, so you can have many nutrition, all nutrition, because there are some nutrition in mango which are not found in banana and some nutrition which are found in banana are not available in apple and then mango and then pineapple 
and it's a long list so every fruit have different nutrition values same goes for the human being every human is different every human has some speciality all you all people sitting in this webinar are special in your own positions you are great in your own positions right so we need to have a mixed workforce it, it, there should be male because there are so many allah created the whole universe and allah made everyone differently everyone has their own super vision their own super values right there are so many good things in male members there are so many good things in female members there are so many good things in community a there are so many good things in community b right so we need to have a mixed workforce and mix in the sense mix in the sense that they should be male members and female they should be community a and they should be community b all communities right all languages language a and language b nationality a nationality b i still remember when i was working in kpmg uh, i was placed in the muscat branch we had people from different parts of the world like we i had a manager from south africa then there was a manager from india then there was a manager from uh, i think it was uh, it was uh, at, uh, greece i think he was an arab so there was a person from portuguese there was a portuguese man and there were some people from pakistan as well like me so everyone has a speciality everyone has something to give to society so we need to have a mixed workforce it's better to have a mixed workforce but of course when you design a work policy when you design a diversity policy there are some factors because it's not easy to handle a diverse workforce right it looks good it feels good that you are having a diverse workforce but there are some practical uh, what you can say limitations to it when there are different types of people then it means there are different type of minds everyone has a different perspective some people uh, eat meat some are not some are veg some are non veg like some things differently and some uh, things the, the other way so when you have different types of workforce you need to have high level of patience right and even in even in uh, it's not just a matter of uh, a workforce even in our normal life we need to have more patience like what we are sitting we are sitting with people we are working with different people different religious perspective different social perspective different organizational perspective so we need to uh, learn how to live among people not similar to us because you know what happens if you talk about uh, uh, diversity people learn more in diversity like for example if i belong to community a for example if i belong to community a and i'm working within the people of community a that i would be then i would be having less learning opportunities because i'm also i'm also from community a and those other people are also from community a they do not have much to give me because they are similar to me but if i am from community a and if i am working with community b c d e f then there are so many different people they have so many unique things they have so many new things to offer me they have, they have so many new things to teach me right so i can learn so many things from them so it is very good for the organization to have a diversified workforce because it creates more developmental opportunities for the employees training and development opportunities okay if you are making a your diversity policy for example for your organization your diversity policy these are the factors which needs to be considered number one before making any diversified workforce we need to consider the business environment of our organization what kind of environment we have for example if i give you an example let's say you are a bank right and you have one branch in london and you have another branch in karachi right for example there are, there are so many branches we are just taking the example of a london branch and karachi branch right around this london branch there are so many different people for example you can say
there is a community A, B, and C outside the organization. So we should have we, we should hire community A, B, and C people within the London branch. But as far as Karachi branch is concerned, there is no community A, B, C. There is community E, F, and G outside the organization business environment. So inside Karachi, we should have community people from community E, F, and G. So organization should consider their business environment. What is in their surroundings? And we need to have our mixed workforce within the organization according to the surrounding of the organization. Did you get this point? It is the key point in managing diversity. A very important point. You need to clear it out. I repeat my words, sir. For example, there are so many branches of our organization, right? And we are taking example of London and Karachi branch, right? And in London branch, what is business environment? Okay, first we need to know what is business environment. Business environment means anything which is surrounding the organization, right? Did you get this or not? Business environment, we study the whole chapter of business environment. Business environment means whatever is surrounded by the organization, right or not? Okay, then London, if you talk about London branch, what are the communities living in London? What are the three communities? Community A, Community B, Community C. So surrounding our organization, surrounding our London branch, there are three communities, A, B, C. So we should have all three communities within our London branch. A, B, C is outside the branch. It is not outside London. It's outside London branch. It's within London. Did you get my point? What I'm saying is in surrounding our London branch, in surrounding of our London branch and inside London, there are three communities living. We better have, we should have all three communities within our London branch so we can handle whenever, wherever, whenever these three communities, A, B, C, reach our London branch, they can see people similar to them. Right or not? Did you get this point, everyone? Everyone get this point? But on the other hand, if it, okay, wherever, okay, I repeat my last point. Whenever communities from A, B, C, people from communities of A, B, C, whenever, wherever they visit our London branch, they would be happy to see the A, B, C people inside the branch. But the same organization has a branch in Karachi. And in Karachi, there are three other communities, E, F, and G. Right? There is no community A, B, C in Karachi branch. So in Karachi branch, there is community E, F, G outside the Karachi branch in Karachi. Whenever, wherever they reach or visit Karachi branch, they would be happy to see E, F, G in their organization. Is this clear to everyone? This is a very crucial point. Thank you, Warren. Next we have address diversity benefits. You see, what is the human psyche? Humans follow anything because on the basis of their benefits, right? You chose ACCA because of its benefits right you're paying for it because of the benefits you're putting your time because of the benefits you're putting your effort because of benefits you studied with someone this fbt course and bt right right now you are having this webinar you're putting your time effort for this webinar just because you see benefit in it a he, there is a human psyche and human psyche is when you look out benefit for anything you keep putting up your effort and money and uh, time on it so if people see the benefits of diversity then they're going to put it up so if we want to make sure that our organization meets diversity requirements 
we need to show people the benefits of the diversity there are so many benefits also right if we talk about let's say uh if, if i say multiple benefits of society for example there's a benefit of diversity that uh, diversity saves you from underperformance underperformance means when you have mixed workforce there could be many ideas there could be creativity right there are so many different people with so many different minds which means more creativity more creative which means upward performance you get this point second point is people learn more in diversified workforce and i told you earlier when people work more in diversified workforce they learn more they have more training and development opportunities it's more cultural activity yes and you can say if i give you an example for example you call uh, a mobile phone company a uh, cellular company let's say you call a cellular company and they say for english press one urdu ke liye do dabaye right i don't know any other language right for chinese press something in chinese if you can if uh, i don't know what is chinese actually right is, is there anyone in the class who can speak or uh, other than english and urdu if they want to share some um, there is a student who is saying that he is learning spanish okay if i in spanish if i say uh for a spanish press 3 what could be the spanish translation for it if you can write here so i will speak out with the other audience you need to translate a sentence for spanish press 3 the student he said that he knows spanish <laughs> he said that he cannot actually translate it okay there is a student who said that he can also speak some of the chinese okay chinese i don't know what chinese what is uh, can you please translate the word for chinese press 3 for chinese language press 3 if anyone can <laughs> translate this someone is giving the suggestion that we need to google it then <laughs> google obviously we can google it okay there is a person who gave the translation in pashto and that translation is the pashto the para teen milava right this means for pashto press 3 you see when you have multiple people uh, you get multiple uh, knowledge right okay as this is a as this is an english webinar so most of the people here are having a command over english and urdu right there are no other languages available right now but we can have this any other later time okay ji you see the benefits of, so if you call a cellular uh, company and they say for english press 1 urdu ke liye do dabaye for urdu press 2 so what happens ke the customer will have more choice for example there are people who are more comfortable in their regional language like someone is more comfortable in urdu someone is more comfortable in english so they will choose their own option of english or urdu or, or spanish whatever so what it makes it makes organization more acceptable it makes organization more attractive it makes more organization more accommodative for example you speak english hai eh? or you have recently landed in the germany right and you don't know dutch language very much so you ask about the people is there any cellular company who offers in both a language english and dutch so i can speak in english right or not because okay this uh, one of our students has given the chinese version of uh, for a chinese press 3 Zhong Wan Chuban Shi San. Lucy, I didn't get it actually. I just read it as it is. 
although I didn't get it. But it's good to have people here of, from different paths, right? Next we have If you want to have diversified workforce in your organization, then, then it should be the leader should follow the first. It's very important that leaders uh, follow. Like for example, if we talk about BOD, your BOD, board of directors should be diversified. If your board of directors is discriminative, then what you talk about others. So the leaders should follow the diversified workforce and they should follow from the, they should lead, they should lead with an example. Right. Next, we have understand your company needs. You see what your organization need. This is very important. What your organization needs. For example, your organization is a chain of hotels. Let's take an example. Your organization is a chain of hotels and uh, you have different hotels in different parts of the world. One is in London, one is in Karachi, and one is in Gawadar. Right? Gawadar is a city of Pakistan where most of the CPAC activities are going. So, if we talk about this, so when we had a performance appraisal of different uh, people in our organization so what we discovered that there is a receptionist in our karachi branch who is also good at chinese right so that receptionist who is in karachi is very good in chinese so we what we did we transfer him from Karachi branch to Gwadar branch why because there are so many Chinese delegations coming from China to Gwadar regarding to CPAC so it is very it would be a good gesture to help them out by having a Chinese receptionist so this helps your company to have a better performance you got this point every company has different needs every company have different perspective this is how you can use it did you get this point everyone a student is commenting that Gawadar is also famous for a recent cricket stadium yes there is a they have built a very good cricket stadium over there and it looks very good in fact lush green and atmosphere is very good and I think they are also having, they are also planning to have a cricket match over there. I am not a cricket fan these days. Okay, Ji. Any question regarding this diversity? So we can move to our next topic. okay next topic we're going to explore today is training and development in fact it's very interesting point in the sense because this is some kind of a chapter which we not only requiring in our career but also throughout our life because those people who keep on training who keep on learning new skills are actually the one who are surviving here right if you want to survive in this world you need to keep on learning new things. You need to keep on learning new things. So what happens that there are so many changes in the organization and in order to maintain those changes, in order to coop up those changes, in order to fulfill the requirement of those changes, we need to have in training and development. For example, 
previously our organization had manual accounting recently we have you know, we are planning to switch to computerized accounting so previously we had manual books of accounting now we are planning to move to computerized accounting what options are available one option is to remove all or employees just terminate all employees <clears throat> and hire new employees do you think it's a good idea to terminate all old employees and hiring a new employee what do you say about this Okay, geez. students are saying no, it's not a good idea. Can you please give me the reason why it is not a good idea? No, it's not a good idea because they are experienced. One reason is because they are more experienced, and the one we uh, the new ones will not be having experience. Okay, if we hire experienced people from the market, then what's next? It is weird to think about this. Okay, Mohsen says it's weird. But why it is weird? And there is a quote from my last class, and that is don't change the face, but face the change. Right. And there's a comment says it would be more time consuming and cost more and all one will about change rapidly as yes? someone says bear the cost right and there's a comment which says we should train our loyal employees right you all are telling me that what to do right because you think it's not a good gesture because and it, there's another problem it gives message to other people of the organization that this organization is going to replace you whenever they find your replacement and this is not a good message because people in working other departments will start to feel that there is some kind of a tissue paper and organization is using them as a tissue paper right and this is not a very good idea in fact And there's a comment which says goodwill gets damaged in fact. Yes, your goodwill in the market will also get damaged. Because when you will start to use people, your goodwill will damage also. So the decision is we will train our employees. And the good news is we are not removing anyone and we are training them. Now the point is the importance of training. Right? What is the importance of training? before going to that importance of training we need to also distinguish between the training and development right this is also a very important point i missed it what is training what is the difference of training and development what is anyone any idea what is the difference of training and development any good reason any good difference Okay, training could be uh, a process of developing new skills, right? Training could be a process of teaching someone a task, like for example, if you're teaching someone a bank reconciliation statement. So if I'm teaching someone, if I'm training someone uh, that how to make bank reconciliation statement, it's a training, right? But development, as far as development is concerned, it's an ongoing process. Right? To clarify our understandings, or you can say polishing, better than before, improvement, 
we can say the word and it's an ongoing process it's a lifetime process as uh, uh, competed by some student right so this mixture of uh, learning new things along with improving the old ones this whole process is called training and development is this clear to everyone moving forward we have the importance of training why in, in training is important for the organization why training is important for the organization reason number one training improves productivity for example there is an employee who make uh, who do perform some task in 10 minutes right after training he performs the same task in five minutes you see his productivity is being doubled right Previously, he was doing the same task in 10 minutes. Now he is doing the same task in five minutes only. Right? So what happens? It is the increase of productivity because previously that took only 10 minutes. Now it is taking only five minutes. So that is the increase in productivity. So what happens? Achha, what is the point of uh, saving the time it would reduce the labor cost it would reduce the overhead cost because our most of the overhead is based on the time so if your time is uh, if you can and you can produce more things right so that's why point number one productivity productivity means rate of production the word productivity means rate of production next we have it improves team spirit what happens when you have for example you have got five number of people one two three four and five when you have got five number of people and there is a person who is not trained in those among five what he will do this fifth person will spoil the efforts of all other four and all other four will be demotivated here okay because what happens when you are working in a team and you are uh, uh, you are five people in a team and one person is untrained that one person mistake can spoil up the mood the motivation and the work of four others so if one if you want to lift the team spirit you want to make sure you should make sure that every person in that team is trained enough did you get this point the team spirit If you talk about this webinar, there are so many people helping out me in this webinar, right? It's a teamwork. Almas is the one who actually organized and all that stuff. And there's an Abdullah who is also helping out and, and, and also some uh, putting some part of it. And there is a, a person who bad working on it. There's so many, there's a person, Khuram, who is working on it. So there's, there's so many people who are working together with me, right? If any of uh, any, if any one of us makes a mistake, of course, it will affect other work. So what happens that we, whenever we work in an organization, right? So we need to put our efforts together. And if you are uh, uh, taking this, uh, is it clear to everyone? Next we have is organization culture. Listen to it very carefully. This is a very, very critical point. And usually people don't consider this point as an important point. You know, training makes organization culture. It's a very critical point. Training makes organization culture. I, I can write, I should write it. Training makes organization culture. I give you the example. What is the meaning of training right new skills uh, new things if some organization does not have a culture of training listen to me if some organization does not have a culture of training it means the employee of those that organization are not learning new skills and when the employees of that organization are not learning new skills there will be a lack of creativity and the organization will have the culture of not 
creative. The, the organization will have the culture of not being creative. You got this point. If the organization is not giving people the training of patience, if the organization is not giving training to people about patience, the employees of that organization will become hyper. They will mess around. They will talk people in bad manner. They will talk with people in loudly. What happens? This will create a toxic culture over there. You see, when I see people, they are arguing with rage and anger. Why don't you do this? This? Oh, come on. You need to be respectful towards people. That is what the education is. Education is not about being perfect. Education is, being, is all about being good with people around you. It's not a matter of just you know, how good you are in doing your work. It's, it also have, matters how good you are with people working around you. So whatever you want in organization, you want to have a creative culture, you want to have a respectful culture, you want to have a productive culture. That culture can only come through the training process. Training makes organization culture. Next point is quality. If we talk about quality, training improves the quality because what happens, training improves the level of quality. A trained employee performs a task in a better way as compared to someone who is not trained. So training improves quality. Number next, healthy work environment. What happens? Training makes the work environment healthy. Healthy in the sense hygiene, healthy in the sense uh, mental health is very important. People usually do not focus on mental health. We all, I have seen so many people, they've always been working on the physical health. We always ignore mental health. You see, there's a problem. We usually think that if, if I say to someone that you need a psychiatrist, he would rage back on me. Oh, come on. Do you think I'm stupid? Do you think I'm mad? Do you think that I am some kind of a person who is having mental problems? No, 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 no. Psychiatrist, you just don't need psychiatrist for, for mental retard. No, no, no. If you eat more than required, if you eat so much, this is a problem. If you sleep so much, it is a problem. So you don't need psychiatrist just for uh, what you can say, mental retard people. Anyone having something other than normal behavior. So... We need to keep a work environment more healthy in terms of physical health, in terms of mental, mental health. In order to make that work environment healthy, for example, you can conduct a training of healthy food. Employees should have healthy food. If you are a follower of cricket or any sports, or football or anything, you know that there is a guy who is usually called a physio, huh? who, is, uh, who is responsible for the health of employees. Right or not? Don't you think there should be a person who should also be responsible for the health of employees in a factory? Huh? If we talk about fitness, what comes in our mind? Uh, cricketer should be fit. A uh, footballer should be fit. Right? A soldier should be fit. Come on, man. An accountant should also be fit. In terms of both physical fitness and mental fitness. What do you say about this? Do you agree this or not? You always see people having a mental uh, fitness person or a physical fitness at sports people. It's not just that. Everyone needs to be fit. Even if, if, if there is a receptionist, right? We need to have mental fitness for that receptionist also because if that uh, receptionist is short-tempered, sooner or later, she is going to, or he is going to spoil the environment of the organization. He or she can misbehave with any customer or any employee. Okay, next we have. 
So training can improve their health. We can have training session of physical training sessions, physical fitness training, and we can have mental. We can we should have uh, uh, sleep management training. You know what is sleep management? It's very important because usually I I find students uh, who are not feeling good and feeling dizzy in the morning because they uh, went to bed late last night. Early to bed, early to rise, makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. This is what we studied, huh? And it is true. You need to go to bed early and you need to get up early. Sleep management, anger management. There should be a, a training of anger management. There should be a training of crisis management, what an employee should do in crisis management. Next is talking about morale. If you talk about the organization, that training improves the morale of the employee. Morale means, you can say it, motivation. You feel motivated for anything about which you are trained. For example, if I'm an accountant, right? I know so many things, but I am having a problem with bank reconciliation statement. Whenever the time of making bank reconciliation occurs, I feel so low. Come on, yar, what is this? Oh, again, I have to make this bank reconciliation. What is this? Yar, how can I do it? This is so difficult. Why it is in my JD? Why boss always ask me to do this bank reconciliation statement? Your employee will be pissed. Why it is this? So if you want to make your employee more motivated, more confident towards any task, train them. Get this point. And of course, training improves the profitability. It's, it's what we can say, the rate of profit, right? Because what happens when you produce good quality, it increases the value of the product. So you can price high. And when you price high, you get more profit. Higher the value, higher the price, higher the profit. Okay, any question regarding this importance of training? I hope it serves the purpose. Next we have training steps. And it, it, in fact, it's very uh, interesting point, training steps. If we talk about training steps, these are the six, seven training steps you, you usually follow in an organization. The first step says identify training needs. It's very crucial to identify the right training needs because what happens if you go to a doctor <clears throat> and the doctor fails to identify whether you need a treatment or not? Because when you go to a doctor, the doctor first decides whether you need a treatment or not. Because sometimes it happens that we feel something irregular in our body and when we go to doctor, doctor says it's okay. There's nothing to worry about it. What you can do is you just need to rest a bit, eat some fruit, have a jogging, have some jogging, or meet your friends. You will be okay with this. You don't need actually consultation over there. So when you talk about people, we need to know whether they need a training or not. If they don't need the training, if the answer is no, we will stop the process on day one, of step one. But if the process says, yes, you need a training, then we will move and we will move to step two. And a stop to step two says what is required. For example, we are planning to give training to an accountant. Right? So what kind of training is required? We need to teach him to calculate tax. This is the uh, requirement we have figured out. We met this accountant and now we have uh, realized that that accountant needs a tax uh, training. Then we also need to identify what are the objectives of training. What are the objectives? You see, there's a difference between what is to be taught and what are the objectives. The We need to teach him tax, right? But what are the objectives? We want to make sure that we have transparent reporting. What is the objective of teaching him tax? The objective of teaching him tax is to we want to have a transport uh, transparent reporting. We want to make sure the reporting of the organization is 
clear, transparent. That's why we are teaching him tax. And we also want to uh, uh, avoid that penalty, which can be uh, applied to us if we calculate wrong tax. If we submit, uh, if we submit wrong tax to the department, tax department, there could be a penalty. There could be legal problems with us. So the objective is to avoid that legal problem through transparent reporting. And the learning required is tax. Did you get? Did, did you all get this? The difference of step two and step three. This is step one. This is two, and this is three. Is everyone okay with step two and three? Because if you don't understand the difference of step three and step two, there will be a problem. Okay, if we talk about step four, in step four, we're going to plan the training program. For example, what kind of training method we're going to use? Because there are so many training methods which we can use in a training. So what are the possible training methods which can be used in the training? Like for example, if we talk, if you say uh, training, I give you an example of training method like the training method we are using is online learning the person the accountant uh, which is uh, we, which we have selected will have our training of tax through online learning method so this is the plan we have we will train our accountant through online training right Okay. Next we have we need to implement the training program. Whatever we planned in step four should be implemented in step five. What is if the word implement? Implement means converting plans into action. This plan needs to be converted into action. How will arrange admission process or arrangement of trainer, arrangement of trainer or training program, whatever you call it. We need to arrange those things because if we are giving him the option of taking some online classes from any institute, so we need to arrange admission for him or her, right? So all those arrangements which are required for this training purpose that has to make. This is called the fifth day that is implementation part of the training. Then there is a stage, stage five, sorry, six, stage six, which says you need to monitor whether he is training the, uh, he is taking the classes correctly or not right we need to review whether it is understandable we can have a small test and like this and we need to also evaluate the training process what is evaluation i give you an example evaluation means comparing your cost of training with benefits of the training you see, you should also look out for the cost and benefit. That is, that is also called cost and benefit analysis. So we need to monitor the process. We need to review it through test. We can review through test. Okay. Keep on looking out. We can test. And the seventh stage here, this dotted line, the seventh stage. What it shows? It shows the situation where when we evaluate, when we review the training program, 
unfortunately the trainee is not up to the mark and then he has to repeat that training you need to he or she needs to restart the training from step two and this is not a good sign the step seven is a problem actually it is actually a problem so what we need to do is that we need to make sure that at stage six you are having a good training session a successful training session and if the training session is not successful you have to switch to step seven which says repeat training and it's not a good sign okay gee. any question regarding this training methods and importance of training so we can move on Okay, next we have methods of training. If we talk about methods of training, all the methods of training in the world categorically falls in two categories. Category number one is on the job, category number two is off the job. I repeat my words all the methods of training falls under two category either a method could be on the job or the method could be off the job on the job method means getting yourself trained during your job and if you talk about off the this is on the job if you talk about off the job training other than your job if i ask you this webinar is a training yes it is a training is it on the job for you or off the job you because we will judge it on the from the basis of training you see right now you are a trainee and i am a trainer in this whole process you are you people students sitting there are trainee and i am a trainer so we need to think on the job of the job from trainees perspective right from trainees perspective so from trainees perspective from your perspective is this on the job or off the job and i want answer from everyone in the webinar I repeat the question you people are sitting in this webinar right and this is a training what kind of training you people are getting is it on the job from your perspective or off the job Okay, all the students responded with of the job. Only one student said it's on the job. The correct answer is it's off the job because you people are not doing job, right? You people are not doing job. This is something other than your job. You have actually not even you have not started the job. So anything other than the job is called off the job training only one student said this is on the job is this clear to him as well you're not doing job na 
when you will go for a job and during a job your boss will come to you or your colleague will come to you and that colleague will tell you something do this and this and this that is called on the job for example you are working in your office and your manager asks you to pass or report a particular or develop a particular report and you don't know how to prepare that report so you ask your colleague can you please help me to to build or make this report and he or she helps you out what is this report how to develop that report then that helping from your colleague to make that report will be considered as on the job training because you are the one doing your job you get this point it's very important to understand this point because if you don't understand it you cannot go further in this chapter so first you need to exactly understand this point on the job of the job specifically i'm trying to um, asking that student who gave wrong answer on the previous question now it's very clear to everyone all of your students here have given me the right answer that's good next validation of training right another point we have that is called validation validation of the training means testing the effectiveness of training in terms of whether the training has been given is being applied or not like if we give training of text to someone if he can after the training after the training if he can calculate text correctly then training is valid if he still calculates it incorrectly then training is invalid it is very simple whether we have achieved the objective of training or not whether we have achieved the purpose of training or not what we discussed earlier we had a purpose of transparent reporting remember that yes the objective of training was transparent reporting after training after training if your what you can say if your uh, after the training if your objective is achieved your reporting is transparent then training is valid not transparent training is invalid is this clear the purpose the objective we want to achieve if we have achieved that purpose then it's okay if we have not achieved that purpose then training is not okay is this clear to everyone okay a student responded name warren said clear if he says clear and he can understand the f1 questions f1 understanding after fbt understanding after this webinar then this webinar is valid if you still cannot understand it obviously there is a problem with it next is evaluation of training as i told you earlier what is evaluation evaluation is a process of comparing your cost of training with the benefit of training and if the cost of training is greater than benefit its evaluation phase unsuccessful and if the cost of training is lesser than benefit like you are considering you are uh, uh, conducting lesser cost right and you are getting more benefit then it is a very successful training do you get this point
And there's a theory uh, from Peter Honey and Alan Mumford. And the theory says learning styles. You know, when you talk about learning style, what does it mean? Learning style means like there are so many students sitting in this webinar, right? Everyone has a diff different approach towards the training. So this theory defines and distinguish among different learners, among different trainees, style of trainees. Because if you want to become a good trainer, first you need to identify what kind of trainees are in front of you. Right? For example, when I teach FBT, right? I know the audience is quite immature because they are students usually in FD and ACCA part one. Lesser mature audience, lesser mature audience. But when I teach LW, that is law. Previously it was called F4, now it is law paper. I expect the audience to be more mature because now they are in ACCA skills module. More maturity, right? More understanding. Uh, and they know much um, about the profession, the qualification. So I expect more about them. So when I enter in the classroom, right? I perceive, I try to perceive my audience, what kind of audience, what kind of age they have, what kind of preference they have. And this is very important because uh, if you are teaching students of Montessori and you're teaching students of class five, you cannot teach them in the same manner. You need to have more patience when you are teaching on Montessori students, right? And if you're teaching class five, lesser patience are required. If you talk about class 10, standard 10, then much lesser uh, patients uh, are required. If you are teaching someone from PhD, right? You are teaching, you are a teacher in PhD program and you're teaching someone from masters, right? Obviously you have a very mature audience. So this topic is all about understanding the styles of training and they identified And they identified four kinds of learning styles, right? Number one is theorist. What are theorists? They always look for the, what you can say, concept. They're not focused on formulas, methods, no, no, no. They're focused on concept, the logic, the rational. For example, if I'm teaching someone accountancy, right? Accounting, financial accounting. And I told the class the entry for investing in form of furniture. What will the entry? Furniture debit, capital. If the owner is investing in the form of furniture, right? So what will the general entry for it? You would say furniture debit, capital credit. Then the theorist of the class will ask, what is the logic? why we are making furniture debit why we are making capital credit reason logic rationale if someone is looking for this that person is called theorist because he's not more interested in that entry but he's more interested in the logic behind the entry right and if you talk about activist these are the people who are more focused on method working procedure and sometimes you need to behave as a theorist and sometimes you need to behave as an activist for example how many of you can drive a car many of you but how many of you know the process of engine inside there are so many people who drive car they are more focused on driving the method understanding the method of the car but they are not interested what is the logic why we should put petrol in the car what petrol does in the engine how it is worked how it is converted into energy most of us are not understanding it most of us are not uh, uh, never try to figure it out so 
if i am giving you if i ask you a question uh what to do with unpresented checks in checkbook sorry bank reconciliation statement if you are making a bank reconciliation statement what to do with unpresented checks if i ask you what do you say what will be the treatment of unpresented checks in bank reconciliation statement there is a comment which says less we will deduct it deduction from where deduction from where so where we will deduct it and the student says from bank statement so we will deduct that from bank statement or bank side or bank balance you can say if you are more focused on method what to do you are activist but if you stop teacher and ask why we are deducting this from bank statement and the teacher will say okay the logic behind this is if as you have issued the check when you issued the check your cash book balance goes down but that check has not been presented in the bank that's why your bank is not down so there's a difference your cash book has been reduced your bank statement has not been reduced in order to have a balance you should also reduce bank statement by deducting your cash book was reduced when the you issued when you issued the check right so your cash book was reduced over there but your bank statement has not been reduced because the person to which uh, to whom you gave the check has not presented it to bank yet but today or tomorrow or day after tomorrow soon he'll present the check and when the check will be presented it will be deducted why don't you deduct it now to have a balance that's why we deduct it from the balance sheet oh, sorry uh, bank statement so if you are looking for this logic then you're a theorist and if you say no no sir we don't want that logic just go on what to do with okay bank statement minus okay cash book plus okay this and that that is what we call activist exactly that is what they say theorist usually say why and activist usually say how clear ji next what we have reflectors what are reflectors reflector are that particular kind of trainees who go their own who go according their own pace right whenever new things in come in front of them they look upon it in their own way and if it reconciles with their own opinion they accept it and if they think it's not okay they reject it so that's why there are a bit slow learners they are a bit slow learners because they keep thinking things from their own perspective for example if i am sitting in the class and teacher is saying this is bank reconciliation statement and you need to deduct uh, the unpresented check from the bank statement as a student when i listen this first i'll try to figure it out whether it is correct or not whether the teacher is right or not and if i find him right i'll accept it if i will find him wrong i'll not accept it the student tries to do things according to i gave you an example when i teach this uh, fbt in class there are some people from commerce background they they already have some knowledge of this uh, subject slight knowledge and there are some people who are from science background you know what the people from science background are blank because they don't know they don't have any prior knowledge of this subject so whatever i say to them they accept it quickly but as far as commerce students are concerned they already have some knowledge it is just like it is just like writing on a board which already have something and it is writing on a board something which is clean already you see the difference 
so reflectors are a kind of a board which already have something on it and the fourth one we have is pragmatist right pragmatists are what pragmatists are those kind of people who have they their objective is to implement what they learn pragmatists are those people who have objective to implement whatever they learn for example if i ask you a question that acc is planning a webinar right and there are two options one computerized accounting and number two uh, what you can say printer repairing huh? right so acc is conducting two free webinars both are free but you have to choose one one out of two either you can go for computerized accounting or you can go for printer repairing what will you will choose just write answer one or two you don't need to write the whole computerized accounting or whole printer repairing just write one or two and i would answer of this from everyone uh, it's very important what do you want to learn computerized accounting or printer repairing we are planning a it is it, just an example huh almas might be hearing it and saying what, what farooq is saying over the two students <laughs> we are not planning to have any uh, webinar for this it's just an example okay most of the students in fact all of the students have chose one in <laughs> only one student wrote two right because you all know that in future you people are going to be accountant and you would be required to have the knowledge of computerized accounting that's why you are more interested on something which is being implemented in your future right that's why you chose one only one student chose two let's ask him why he chose printer repairing and the student name is sir sir can you please tell us why you chose one oh, sorry why you chose two no no <laughs> okay you wrote in the box printer repairing na maybe that is by mistake okay okay so we all are on same page everyone here is choosing number 1 because you know you need to implement it in your life you need to implement computerized accounting in your life no one from you is interested of becoming a printer repairer so you would say this webinar is not helpful us sir because it is not going to affect our actual life and you are a pragmatist you people are pragmatists because you want to implement what you learn you see what is pragmatist and the interesting point is you can be theorist and pragmatist in the same time for example you are sitting in the class and asking for the logic what is the logic you are a theorist and why you are asking the logic because you want to implement it so you are a theorist and pragmatist at the same time you could be activist and pragmatist at the same time you see it 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 depends on the mood sometimes i come to class and like if i am a student for example if i am a student and in the morning i am i have come to class and i'm very tired i ask the question the teacher what is the logic what is the concept this 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 after 3 hours of continuous class i bit a feel low and less uh, energized and i would say okay sir tell us the method only i am not interested in logic just just tell us the simple way to do this 
I don't want to know the the long methods, the understanding, the logic, the mechanism, and that stuff. Why? Because now at the end of the day, having less energy, I am not theorist anymore. And sometimes I'm activist in the morning, and sometimes I'm activist theorist in afternoon. You see, people do change. Is this clear to everyone? Great. I think we better take a break here, right? And we will back at twelve fifty five. 1253 right
Hello, Jee. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back. Can you please tell me, am I audible, loud and clear? Hello, 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 everyone. Am I audible to you? Okay, Jee. Thank you very much. Let's have a start. And the next chapter we're going to explore is performance appraisal. Yes, you remember when you were in school, ah, huh? good old school days. You had test, you had quizzes, final test. Why they had all these things? Any opinion? Why schools used to have test? What is the purpose of test? One reason could be to create problems for students, huh? <laughs> right? Most of the students would like be having tests, huh? Okay, this could be a reason. Okay, it, it was just a funny thing. What could be the proper reason? Yes, to check your performance, right? So test is actually that mechanism that checks your performance, that evaluates your performance. And same goes in college, university, and other areas. So don't you think there should be a mechanism in your uh, at your work at your job which evaluates your performance and that mechanism which evaluates your performance at workplace is called performance appraisal. The word performance means work, appraisal means evaluation. So it's a mechanism which evaluates the performance of employees. Did you get this? So this is the key behind this chapter. Why we, why this chapter has been included and what this chapter is all about. If you talk about appraisal objectives, if you talk about appraisal objectives, right? What are the objectives of appraisal? First objective of appraisal is what to do, right? You see, when, if, I, if I say to you that uh, after two days, we are going to have a test. If I say to you that after two days, we are going to conduct a test, what would be your first question after listening to this? Hmm? What you would ask to me? You people are going to have test after two days. What do you say? Okay, test of which topic, somebody wrote topics, somebody wrote what will be in the end of the test, somebody wrote need time for revision, somebody wrote what is to be included in text, what will be asked, ask you to provide the areas. Yes, it means that you want to know what to do. You see, so performance appraisal, when we hire employee and on day one we tell them, that you, we, you will be analyzed on the basis of how much cooperative you are and you will be analyzed how much uh, uh, punctual you are and you will be analyzed how much creative you are. So actually we are telling him what to do, right? So whenever we hire someone and on the first day one, on day one we tell them you will be need to be cooperative and punctual, you will be tested on it. In other words, I'm saying, what to do. So this is the objective number one of appraisal to tell employees what to do. Right? Number two we've got is key results. You see, when we analyze the performance of any employee, we tell them the key results. What kind of ex results we are expecting.
You see? Okay, I ask you a question. If I give you two tasks, task A, task B, and you are required to do them at a time, and you have only uh, a time to do only one task, either you can do task A or you can do task B, what you'll do? Huh? If I ask you to do two tasks, and you only have time for one task, what you'll do? Okay, the student wrote, which is more important? Yes, you'll ask the priority, sir, what is the priority of these tasks? And I'll say B is more important, then you will do B. So you need to know what are the key results we are looking for. Right? Next, why do we do go for performance appraisal? That is compensation level. You know, performance appraisal gives the result of employees their performance so that we can set their salary and other benefits according to their performance. The salary level, the benefit level an employee receives should be equivalent to the performance. And that performance we evaluate through performance appraisal mechanism. Right? So this is what we need to do. Next is promotion. We need to take promotional decisions. Whom should be promoted? And how to decide this? Of course, the performance. Your decision of performance should, your decision of promotion should be based on performance. And next is training and development needs. So whenever we do performance appraisal of an employee, we can find the weakness of that employee. So what happens, the performance appraisal identifies weakness or employee. And to recover that weakness, we have to give him training. So performance appraisal helps us to identify weakness and Proper training should be given according to that weakness. Right? Next, what we have, we have process of appraisal. What is the overall process of appraisal? If we talk about the process of appraisal, first point is we need to identify the criteria for assessment. You know what is the criteria for assessment? Criteria of assessment means on what grounds we will judge the performance of employee for example if we talk about sales men okay we are doing a process of appraisal of a sales person so what are what is the criteria of assessment like say if i say uh, it should be on the basis of confidence we would judge what kind of confidence he has right any suggestions from you Confidence and what do you say? We should judge him on the basis. Criteria number one, confidence. Any other criteria which you suggest? Motivation. How motivated he is towards his job. That was given by student persuasion skills that was given by a student very good you people are going good persuasion skills
uh, cooperative he is or product knowledge how much product knowledge he or she has right so these are the criteria on which we will judge someone's performance so the first point the first step of performance appraisal is tell the employee the criteria of assessment number two you need to prepare an appraisal report what is an appraisal report actually you remember that uh, your performance report when you were in school you were in college yeah huh? how many marks you have scored obtained marks total marks grades right a a plus and all that stuff that test report is actually your appraisal report right that shows your performance and number 3 which we need to hear do here is appraisal interview what is appraisal interview you remember that ptm parent teacher meeting during a school days what was the objective of that ptm if any one of you can elaborate shortly what was and what is the objective of ptm parent teacher meeting i'm talk, i'm talking about parent teacher meeting any opinion okay ji student said let parents know about the progress of their children okay let progress right up uh, what happens can uh the objective of the ptm so your parents can know the level of performance but if you are working in an organization you are grown enough you know need your parents to be there so what they do they call you for an interview and in that interview they show you your appraisal report and tell tell you and give you feedback about your appraisal report right number 4 step review of the assessment by assessor own supervisor you see that appraisal report needs to be rechecked and rechecked by whom to be rechecked by the supervisor of the person who is doing your appraisal right the person who is doing employees appraisal is the one who makes this report this report needs to be rechecked by the supervisor of appraiser you know there are two people appraiser and appraisee appraiser is the one who does the appraisal and the appraisee is the one of whom appraisal is being done so when you give test in your institute or in college you being appraisee and the teacher or the tester who is making the test conducting the test is the appraiser so if this is a sales person right if i say if uh, the appraisee is sales person and appraiser is sales manager then this recheck should be done by senior manager because this is the appraisal process this is appraiser and this is appraisee and this is the one who needs to recheck recheck what recheck the appraisal report and this appraisal report is made by sales manager about sales person and this needs to be rechecked by sales manager is this clear to everyone just to make sure that sales manager have not been biased just to make sure that sales manager is not doing any sort of favoritism and just to have recheck right senior I, I, as i told you earlier the senior manager checks it just to make sure there's no favoritism or there's no uh, biasness going over there that's why they do it
right? Next we have preparation of an implementation of action plans. You see what happens when we go to the appraisal interview, right? I'm talking about appraisal interview. We need to plan something, huh? Plan what? Plan the improvement. For example, a salesman have planned that uh, previously he was explaining the product to customer in three minutes. Now we, we have planned to explain product to customer in five minutes. Right, previously you were having a discussion with uh, customer, the salesperson was explaining the product to customer for just three minutes. Now they are focusing on five minutes. Right, this is what we call action plan. This is an action plan to achieve improvements. Right, and there's number point number six that is follow up. This follow up is to be done by appraiser to check whatever commitments made by appraisee in step five, whether he or she is following it or not. Appraiser do follow up after appraisal interview. I repeat, appraiser do follow up after appraisal to check and make sure whether the appraisee is implementing the action plans which he or she committed in step five. Like he committed to give five minutes to customer instead of three, just to check it whether he is giving five minutes or not. If he is giving five minutes, then tell him in follow up that I have been observing and it's good, it's great that you have been giving five minutes. And if he or she is not giving five minutes and still giving three minutes, then we need to tell him as well that as you committed of five minutes, but unfortunately for some reasons, you are giving just three minutes. So the appraisee can know, so the appraisee can know that someone is having an observation, someone is having an eye, someone is watching. And it's not just a matter of watching or monitoring someone. It is a matter of giving them feedback because if I work at any point, uh, if I work in any organization, I want to have feedback because I want to know whether I'm going in the right direction or not. For example, you are driving a car and you have a Google map with you and Google map is telling you where are you right now and you are on the right track. It gives you comfortable, the feel of comfortableness that yes, you are in the right direction. Right? Okay, there's a question. Sir, please repeat point five. You see, if we talk about point five, okay, I'll give you example. You see, when you were in school and in those days, you had a PTM and during that PTM, you commit, you put some kind of commitment with the teacher. Yes, teacher, I will study. Yes, teacher, I will work hard. Yes, teacher, I will put some efforts and study. Remember that? What was that? That was your action plans. I will study after watching Cartoon Network at five. I, that was your action plan, actually. In organization, in your uh, corporate life, in your working life, you also make commitments with your employer. I will do this, I will, do, I will do this, right? So you are a salesperson. Previously, you were giving three minutes to every customer while explaining the product. Now you want to improve yourself, so you want to put more effort and you have decided that you would put five minutes to explain the product to customer. Explaining more to customer will increase the chances of sales. And this is what this is why you're there. 
so you plan and implement the action plans to achieve your performance is this clear to you a student asked me to repeat point number five you're welcome okay the next we have types of appraisal there are many types of appraisal there are many ways an appraisal can be done first is self appraisal you know what is self appraisal self appraisal is all about being self responsible huh right we want to make sure that all our employees are enough mature enough uh, uh, they have enough sense of responsibility that no one is going to come for me i have to improve myself you know and what it saves the time of the uh, uh, supervisor you know the easiest student who is the easiest the one who wants to study i know who, who is the most difficult student i think it's i would say they are impossible students who do, do not want to study right so there we need to create the sense of responsibility among employees and if we able if we if we have been able to create it then what it will be called it's a self appraisal process but the problem with the self appraisal self appraisal is uh sometimes we commit mistakes which we don't know that this is a mistake right so in self appraisal people sometimes do not judge themselves properly and i would say being a human being uh people don't realize their own mistake including me right if you talk about me and all people usually people do not look upon their own mistakes they always somebody said that we are the best lawyer for ourselves and the most cruel judges for others right we find problems in others even if it is a slight problem and we never find problems in ourselves so sometimes what happens when you do self appraisal you don't find a problem in yourself but there are problems right number 2 is upward appraisal you know what is upward appraisal i give you example huh? for example there is an appraisal going uh i give you example sales manager is doing appraisal of sales person in fact example should be like the senior manager sorry senior manager is doing appraisal of sales manager right let's re elaborate senior manager is doing appraisal of sales manager and in this case first tell me who is the appraiser in this case who is the appraiser in this case senior manager is the appraiser and who is the appraisee sales manager right good now what is upward appraisal i'll tell you the upward appraisal the senior manager ask sales person about sales manager i repeat the senior manager asks sales person about sales manager the senior manager will take the opinion of sales person about the performance of sales manager like how much cooperative sales manager is because sales manager will always be cooperative with senior manager there is no point he is his boss if if we want to judge the cooperativeness i repeat my words if we want to judge the cooperativeness of sales manager we should ask his level of cooperativeness from sales person because everybody is cooperative with their boss right the one who is actually cooperative is the one who is cooperative with their subordinates if you are cooperative with your subordinate then actually you are cooperative and if you are cooperative with your boss it's 
it's oh, it's normal you have to be you got this point Next is customer appraisal. You know what is a customer appraisal? When you ride on Uber, huh? after Uber, they ask you for rating. Huh? Star, star one, two star, three star, four star, five star. Right? That rating given by the customer to Uber about that ride, about the rider is an example of customer appraisal. Right? Can anyone of you give me the example of customer appraisal? Okay, the one student gave the example that feedback at the restaurant. Yes, after the dinner, a good warm dinner, they ask you for the uh, uh, appraisal, the feedback. How was the hygiene? How was the taste? How was the service? How was the delivery? How was the presentation? Okay. There's another student who said that they restaurant yes the same example sometimes they ask you about the product they are selling for example there's a clothing brand and once they sell the product to you after a few weeks they will call you and ask how was your experience how was your product experience right how was your wearing experience of that product they send messages sometimes yes are you satisfied with the internet speed which you are using and I expect from all of you to send me a feedback on the WhatsApp group, right? About the experience of this webinar. Because you know, everyone wants to have a feedback, right? That creates motivation to do that work again and again and again. I'm also one of them. <laughs> Okay, G. next we have appraisal interview. There's a student who asked which feedback is preferable. Customer 360 or upward. Obviously, all feedbacks are good, whether it is uh, Custom appraisal or 360 degree or upward appraisal all kinds of feedback are good because they are from different perspective You see when you uh, Use OLX app Right there are people who put ads on it and there are some intelligent people who give the ad of the product with multiple uh, Pictures from different dimensions the more pictures you have of that product this easier for you to take the decision so when you take uh, feedback from different perspectives right you get it more beneficial more meaningful so all from all perspective next appraisal interview how to do appraisal interview first you prepare your interview what to prepare you need to look for the sample sorry uh, for the appraisal report so before uh, going for appraisal interview both appraiser and appraisee should read appraisal report right 
Number two, you do interview of the appraisal report. And please, please, please listen to employee appraisal. Because what happens during the interview, sometimes what happens, I, I would say most of the times, the appraiser keep on saying, keep on talking, do this and this, you could be, you could be better like this. Come on, man, this is the appraisal of that person. Please let him speak. Let him identify his problems. Let him identify his issues. It is a collaborative process. This is not a charge sheet. This is not something to show the problems. This is something to solve the problem. You're not supposed to just show the problems. No, 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 no. You're supposed to solve them. Right? So this should be the approach of the interview. And then, of course, ask for a commitment. As I told you earlier, in previous example, you committed instead of three, you would give five minutes. Your workings were nine to five. No, your working is nine to six. So you can handle customer more efficiently, more sales, better performance. This is how you should be doing the work. You see the gain commitment. And of course, follow up. Okay, thank you Fazan for your feedback. I hope I'll help you out in future as well. Right in next two days, inshallah, ta'ala, I will try to keep up the things more smooth, more useful, inshallah. Okay, the as far as follow up is concerned, this is something which we already discussed. And can you please tell me who will do the follow up? Appraiser or appraisee? Appraiser will do the follow-up. Yes, appraiser will do the follow-up. And in that follow-up, he will check the level of commitment made by appraisee, whether he or she is doing it or not. This is also part. So again, they will meet up again. After a few days, 15 days, 20 days, they'll have a re-visit uh, to things. So they'll meet again to discuss the commitment made by appraisee. I hope this is okay and serves the purpose. And in that uh, meeting and afterwards, this is called feedback. Feedback is very important. You know, keep on giving feedback individually or collectively because you know what happens when people are doing some work, they need to know where they are leading. As I told you earlier, a, a few minutes back, I gave the example of Google Map. If you are having a Google map in your car and you're going to some new uh, direction or new location, have you not seen that area? You need constantly Google map huh? and Google map tells you that you, yes, you are going in right direction. Yes, 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 Farooq Mirza, you are going in right direction. You see, so when you're going in right direction, it helps you out. There are two types of feedback usually given. One is motivational feedback. If someone performs above the expectation, for example, we gave the target of 300 units to a person and actual sales was 325. It means you are above the target. So the motivational feedback should be given. The feedback should be given there is called motivation. But if you give target to someone 300 units and he or she only uh, managed to sell 250 units, then the feedback needs to be given here is developmental feedback because that person needs development, improvement. 
but please make sure to remember that both feedbacks are important not just motivational but developmental also right you can give individual feedback as well right like what happens sometimes we don't want to give uh, we don't don't we don't want to discuss things in uh, in front of other people so if one of, if any one of you has some questions or they want to feedback they want to give suggestions and not in group they can uh, send me message separately as well so you can send me messages individually or separately if you want to discuss something which you don't want to discuss in front of others so that we can make sure that to help you out in your particular way right like i remember uh, there is a student who asked about that uh, what was that point uh, and there was a question in team development team working he asked me what was that belbon team rules yes so i'm planning to uh, send an audio of belbon team rules on the group right because that person requires individual so what i thought kd rather than giving individual response i better respond it in the group so that everyone can be benefited because we are having this time limit here in this webinar this only have this webinar only have 15 hours so obviously we cannot discuss all the topics here but what we can do here is uh we can give uh separate audio notes we can send this audio notes to students and i will send audio notes in uh, whatsapp group right so to fulfill those individual perspectives next we have right you see feedback should be constructive right feedback should be constructive what makes a feedback constructive uh, right time right respect feedback given with respect matrix constructive start with positive huh whenever you giving feedback to someone start with positive so feedback is something which needs to be constructive maybe your motivational feedback is destructive because if you praise someone so much that person might have a problem of overconfidence so if you are giving feedback in such a way that it it's making someone overconfident that then that motivational feedback is destructive Okay, there's a student who's asking about detail notes. You're talking about the notes of uh, new chapters included in F1? Actually, Sanjana, if I don't spell it correctly, sorry. If I don't correct, uh, you talk, okay. I'll send it uh, by today evening, inshallah. Just remind me on the group if I forget. I will send the detailed notes of new topics by today evening. I request to just uh, give me a reminder because you see uh, uh, as we are having online class of other sections uh, with which i'm regular at uh, the regular batches i am teaching there is so much traffic on whatsapp these days so many students so sometimes what happens that teachers misses a whatsapp a message so in this case give me a pardon for that Okay, G. The next chapter or today's last chapter we're going to start that is organization structure. Right. And strategy, organization structure and strategy. What this all whole chapter is all about. You see. what is organization structure you know uh, in our body there's an internal mechanism right when we eat food there is a particular section which digests our food right we see through eyes we listen through ears we smell through nose so there is a body structure in our body and there are mechanisms of every part what to do 
same goes for the organization organization also have internal structure right Okay, I've sent you the WhatsApp number. You can send a message, then I will send the WhatsApp group link. Right? You can also write it from here. This is my WhatsApp number. You can send messages on it so we can have uh, notes sharing there. Okay? Okay, gee. we're talking about organization structure. So organization structure the, is the internal mechanism of an organization system, work, procedures, and all that stuff. Right? The first structure is we're going to explore is Minsberg structure. Minsberg was a theorist. He gave us this structure. And this structure is all about uh, what he suggests was what kind of organization structure we can have. This is the suggested structure. First, we have someone, Minsberg says, strategic apex. What is strategic apex? The one who makes policy, right? Whoever is making the policy. For example, whoever makes policy in Honda, when and how the electrical vehicles need to be made when honda should come into the business of electrical vehicles how honda should come what will be the policy of honda regarding electrical vehicles so whoever is making this policy is the strategic apex of honda right whoever is taking this decision can be considered as the strategic apex of honda if we talk about the middle line middle line are the, the one who implements those policies implements those policy made by strategic apex they make sure that these policies are being followed by others and then the operating code is the one who actually follows those policies made by strategic apex so strategic apex the makers of the policy middle lines implementers of the policy the operating code the followers of the policy and during this whole process, there should be someone who help you out technically, right? From legal, it could be from legal perspective or technical perspective. So those who help us out in, in the whole process, there should be someone of expert of that particular field that is a technical perspective, technical structure. And there should be someone who can help us out in support stuff. For example, someone who makes tea in canteen is actually doing a supporting activity right so these are the five areas which an organization should have in a structure any question in this regard Support staff is someone who does the sideline activity. For example, for example, what Honda does, they make, they produce automobile. And during the whole process, people will get hungry. Someone should be there to make food for them. That person who is making food for them is a support staff. Right? And there should be someone who should be expert of legal formalities of producing electrical vehicles those people who are expert in legal advices or technical advices can be termed as techno structure guards for a factory are considered as support staff
suppose i am studying i am teaching in a college let's say i teach in tabani school of accountancy right and the people who are uh, working in a photocopy which creates copy of uh, notes they are called support staff yes maintenance staff is also support staff those who are selling stationery at an institute are also considered as support staff next we have departmentation what is departmentation in simple words <coughs> sorry departmentation is a process of segregating organization dividing organization to handle it in a better way you see when we when the organization is grow growing for example previously organization was too small it was easy to handle now it's getting big and big and big so if the organization is getting big and big and big we need to have now what we can do we can divide it in departments so we can handle them accordingly so whenever any organization grows we need to handle it accordingly and that handling technique of organization is called departmentation because what we do we divide organization in different departments to have a better control and grip over the organization activities right and if we talk about organization departments we can create departments on the basis of number 1 functional let's say we when we say sales department when we say production department when we say purchase department what is it it's functional departmentation we are dividing organization on the basis of functions to be performed by different employees some are doing sales some are doing production some are doing purchase so this is a departmentation called functional departmentation right but we can also divide the part organization on the basis of product for example someone is handling the sales of civic someone is handling the sales of city someone is handling the sales of accord so we have divided our organization on the basis of product civic is another product city is another product accord is another product number 3 we are going to divide organization on the basis of customer like we can uh, divide domestic customer and airline can divide customers in two areas like domestic customer international customer that is the division of uh, organization on the basis of customer right and we talk about geography we can have different departments on the basis of geography like we can have a branch at south at north right at west so when we divide organization on the basis of geographic areas south northwest this is a this is an example of geographic departmentation right okay if i ask you a question here if we divide our organization on the basis of i give you an example and ask you a question those who pay through cash or those who pay through credit card some people pay through cash some people people pay through credit card what kind of departmentation is this yes it's customer departmentation right okay okay if i say you there is a hospital who offer two types of 
services, one OPD and one emergency. What kind of departmentation is this? OPD and emergency. It's a product based departmentation. Function is same to treat the customer, to treat the patient. Same function, but the, but the thing is, one is quick service, this is emergency. One is normal speed service, that is OPD. Right? Okay, if I make two WhatsApp group, one is based on Pakistan, one is Middle East, and one is Europe. If I make three groups of students, one for Pakistani, one for Middle East, one for Europe, what kind of departmentation is this? Yes, it's geographic. Right? Next we have matrix structure. You know what happens, what is matrix structure? Matrix structure has two different, two important aspects. Okay, before starting this, I'm planning to have an MTQ session tomorrow, inshallah. And in that MTQ section, because uh, by tomorrow we would be, would, we would have covered most of the topics, right? So tomorrow, uh, by end, I'm planning to have MTQ uh, session because uh, by the end of tomorrow, we would be would have been completed uh, around 15, uh, 14 uh, chapters, right? So after and having a review of 14 chapters, it would be easier for us to have a look at MTQs, right? So stay tuned till tomorrow we'll have an MTQ session. Okay, if we talk about matrix structure, matrix structure has two different, uh, two significant element. One is they make product departmentation of function. If I ask you, what is this? Production, sales, distribution, R&D, marketing. What kind of departmentation is this? Yes, it's functional, right? So matrix structure has two important elements. Number one, it's, it uses functional departmentation, right? One point. Number two point, functional plus Product, functional plus product. If you ask, this is product. Product A, product B, product C. To make it more meaningful, let's give name. Like we can give name, it's uh, it's bread, it's butter, it's jam. So these are this is what we call product departmentation, right? So this is functional departmentation, and this is product departmentation. And the second important thing is dual reporting structure. You see, this is a person, Mr. A, who is reporting to finance department head and jam department head. So he is re reporting in two different directions with two, two different people. This is what we call dual reporting structure. Right? 
So this is what we call dual reporting structure. So matrix organization has two different perspectives. Number one, uh, they have functional department plus product department and they have a unique thing that is called dual reporting structure. Next we have it's called shamrock structure. Shamrock structure says if you want to manage organization in a better way, you better have four departments. One professional core, professional core are those people who are essential for the success of organization. You cannot survive without them. They are very core, essential to the organization. And there are some self-employed professional who telecommute. They change themselves from one organization to another organization. Right? They work in one organization, then another, then another. And there are some contingent workforce which we hire on the basis of need. You can also call it jobless structure. Because we call them, we get them work from them whenever, whenever it is needed. And there are some customers. You see, when you go to restaurant, there is a self-service option. And the customers do the task of waiter. So as a customer, when you think task of waiter, you're actually doing it yourself. You see the sham, so, so it, this structure was given by Handy, right? So Handy says that if you want to have a effective organization, you can draw up like this, right? Then there's a concept of span of control. What is span of control? A span of control refers to the number of subordinates directly reporting to an officer. Span of control is number of subordinates reporting directly to a superior officer. So if it is lesser number of people, for example, five people are reporting, right? Or there are 10 people are reporting. If you compare five with 10, then would say five is narrow, 10 is wide. But if you are comparing 10 with 15, then we would say 10 is narrow, 15 is wide. So if you are having lesser number of people reporting, that is called narrow span of control. And if you are uh, saying that more people are reporting, then it is called wide span of control. Then there's a concept, scalar chain. What about scalar chain? Scalar chain refers to the number of hierarchical level. How many organization level you have, right? For example, if I say, this is an organization. How many hierarchical levels it has? One, two, three, four, five. So you would say, scalar chain of this organization is five because there are five hierarchical levels there. But if there are a higher number of hierarchical levels, let's say six, as compared to lesser number of hierarchical levels, that's four. So we would say if you have higher number of hierarchical levels, this will be considered a tall organization. But if you have lesser number of hierarchical levels, that would be called flat organization. Got this point? The higher number. Yes, delaying is again a part. I give you the example of delaying. Okay, the scalar chain of the organization is five. But when you delay, check, I'm removing the layer. You see, I've removed the layer. Now the scalar chain has become four because I just removed this layer. This is what we call delayering. You got this point? Removing an entire layer in the organization is called delayering. And when we do delayering, 
we reduce the scalar chain There's a question from Abdul Rahman. I didn't get your question, Abdul Rahman. Can you please re-elaborate? Okay, you're saying to differentiate between span of control and a scalar chain. You see, there's a difference. I gave you the reason, example. There's a difference. Scalar chain is the levels of hierarchy and span of control is the number of people reporting how many people are reporting to someone is span of control how many like this is a and there are three people report reporting to a a is the boss B is reporting, C is reporting to him, D is reporting. We would say span of control is 3. But as far as scalar chain is concerned, it is the level 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So we say scalar chain is 5. Is this okay with you? Span of control refers to the number of people reporting. And scalar chain refers to the level of hierarchies in the organization. Is this clear to you and others? Okay, I'll tell you this. We can also say that We can also say that when a scalar chain, when a scalar chain is tall, you have narrow span of control. And when a scalar chain is flat, you have wide span of control. This is what you're asking, right? When the scalar chain is tall, you have narrow span of control. When your scalar chain is flat, you have wide span of control, right? This is it. I hope this serves the purpose. Next is delayering. As I told you earlier, delayering is the process of removing the layer in an organization. For example, organization have one two three four five layers right so if you remove one layer as i told you you remove this layer you see i remove this layer and this is called delayering because there was a layer i removed it why do we do delayering what are the reasons number one it could be because of information technology Cashiers are removed with ATMs. If this is the case, this is information technology. Or empowerment, because what happens when we do delaying, the juniors are empowered. What happens if we remove layer number three, then the power of layer number three will go to layer number four. And of course, it's economy lesser number of employees will result economy and it's fashion or what this is point number d fashion in the sense because nowadays do you think have you seen that we are having these days we are having driver less cars people are so uh, energized and they are so much what you can say astonished to see driverless cars you see when you remove all the drivers in the uber this is what we call delaying 
If in future Uber and Kareem offer you services with driverless cars, that will be become the part of the fashion. Everybody will be excited to have this. And the last point from today's session is centralization and decentralization. You know what is centralization and decentralization? Centralization is something when senior managers keep the authority of decision making. So decision making authority is with senior managers. They decide what to be done in the organization. But if you talk about decentralization, decentralization means that decision making authority has been given has been given by senior managers to junior managers right so when senior management give a decision authority to junior manager this is called decentralization and then when they keep this authority to them with themselves this is what we call decentralization Right? Any question in the centralizing? Sometimes organization can have both uh, uh, policies with them because some policies are centralized and some policies are decentralized. So, Kiji, any question in this as we have reached the end of the session? Thank you very much for being with us. I hope this is beneficial for you. Uh, we will meet tomorrow, inshallah, with day four. There's a question, and that question is I read out that question. Sir, senior manager could delegate any authority. Yes, senior manager can delegate authority to junior manager because there is an uh, there are some organizations who have different prices according to their branch every branch have different pricing policy and senior managers have given authority to branch manager to decide the pricing policy according to the people living around the branch so what happens that senior managers knows that there are some issues which only junior manager can understand like pricing policy because pricing should be according to the people living around that society living around that branch so sometimes they give authority to junior manager or branch managers to decide the price of the product for their branch is this clear to you i hope this serves the purpose thank you very much allah Hafiz.